So welcome, all of you. This is um, wonderful to be back in here and be in this place with so many people. Um, I know that may be a little trepidatious to some of you, but it's pretty awesome, uh, I think, to finally be able to be celebrating back at the Whitliff. So um, we have an incredible group of folks here. And I'm not going to go through all their credits because we'd be here for the whole 45 minutes doing that. Um, but we have all of these fellows were involved in Lonesome Dove. We have uh, Van Ramsey sitting next Next to me, and Barry Tubb on the end, um, Carrie White, and Eric Williams. Eric was the prop master on the film. Um, Carrie was the production designer and art director. Barry was Jasper Fant, and of course, costumer Van Ramsey. And all of these folks are in some way um, immortalized here at the Whitliff, right? Uh, because the Lonesome Dove collection is here, and some of their collections are here as well. So, welcome all of you. Um, I'm going to uh, start by talking about uh, this is the filmmaker's voice and, and about making a classic, which of course um, Lonesome Dove is and which most people don't know they're making a classic when they're making it. Um, it probably feels quite a bit different. Uh, but in the world of film, the director is credited most often as the filmmaker. But um, in fact, the craft of film is a really fascinating one because so many people really become part of that woven story that shows up on the screen. And all of these guys really um, did an amazing uh, amount of work to get there. So um, I'm gonna, a quick quote to start this off from an article that uh, Steve Harrigan, um, who's also in the collection, uh, wrote in Texas Monthly while the film was being shot. And he said, a group of horsemen came riding from one end of the street toward the deep wash that led down to the river. They were seated on antique, high-backed saddles and armed with horse pistols and Henry repeating rifles and green river skinning knives. The horses looked as lanky and weathered as the men who rode them, and the spectacle of them wading into the tranquil river in the charged evening light was so exhilarating that for a moment it was possible to disregard the crowd of camera operators, grips, sound men, lighting technicians, script supervisors, and wranglers that testified to, that testified to the somewhat dispiriting fact that it was all just a movie. And so I just want to kick it off, um, and we can just start here with you, Van. With, you know, talk to us about, about how you approached um, the project, the world you built uh, on for this film, and the world that made us believe that Lonesome Dove um, was personified, um, the book was personified on the screen by all of you. So can you talk about what your, sure. your part of that was? Well, my part was to um, make everything authentic. But Bill Whitliff made me watch some westerns, and he's, and I watched them, and he said, we don't want it to look like that. And I thought, <laughs> why did you make me watch this? But anyway, the, there had never been a western that had really been done in the true period before, so this was the, you know, and I, I guess I, w I operated out of fear because we had so little time and I thought, how are we going to do this? Because it's not, you see Gus and you see Colin, you see Lorena and all that stuff, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is you have to create the world that these people live in. And unfortunately, on this cattle drive, they lived in a bunch of different worlds. They would move from town to town to town and went into San Antonio and I thought, all this work we did on San Antonio, and it's like two minutes on film or something <laughs> that you actually see these Mexican people that are in really period clothing. So that was that was the challenge. It was the time factor and just the getting it done. But we had incredible crews who were willing to work. They, you know, a lot of them had just come out of. Um, SMU and the University of Texas from from the costume department. So they were gung ho. They wanted to do everything, and so it was good because we had them work 24 hours a day. So <laughs> it's like, and we kept shifting shifts. Like this ship would come in, and then another ship would come in, and the costume shop was working 24 hours a day with about 20 seamstresses were sewing constantly. And it wasn't so much that it, we, we, the drovers and the, uh, the cattle drive people, their costumes had to be in 
six different stages of distress. So we had all of these things in the trailer and luckily we pretty much shot in sequence, but normally you don't shoot in sequence. So you have to age them and get them done before the actual thing happens. And then I guess, and then the other hard part was the, <laughs> the gun, the gun shots, because it, it each costume has to be squibbed with a little blood packet in it. And then when they shoot them, it blows the costume up. So you can't use that again. So you have to have you know, three or four of those prepared in order to shoot somebody. So that was. Yeah, a ton of work and a ton And the of boots, work. the shoes were, the bo Bill wanted the boots to be right. And boots then were made out of two pieces of leather, not four, like two on the heel and two on the side. It was just two pieces of leather without a toe box in it, which made them very soft, which also made Robert Duvall go through three pair of boots while we were filming mm -hmm. because he wore them out. So, but at least they were accurate. So that was, <laughs> I was, I, you know, I didn't know what we were making at the time. I just knew that, you know, everybody was, Bill kept saying, I want this accurate, I want this accurate, I want this, and I was like, oh my God, how am we gonna do this? But, you know, and he was a huge help because he came and worked on the hats. He wanted everybody to have a different silhouette. And, you know, you gotta have doubles on all of those hats. So he was, Bill was always the first person on the set and the last person to leave. And I think that's what set the standard for everybody working so hard. Yeah. So, so Carrie, you're part, like, from that first scene with Gus on the porch that now is the famous photograph of Bill's, right? Um, that ranch house shack, the pigs, you know, the, the grounds. That, like, how did you approach taking this book apart, too, to, to make this world feel like the world that it was in Larry's book and, and in Bill's script, you know? You know, with that, the Hat Creek outfit, I actually went to found this old place that was in de very derelict condition and took the windows and doors off of it myself <laughs> and saved them to go on that, that building. Huh. So, you know, you, that's what you do. And I, I was thinking about this the day before yesterday. I was driving here from West Texas because uh, I'm actually working on another show that sort of bookends Lonesome Dove. When I started, it was an odyssey about this trip from Texas to Montana. Now I'm doing another show called 1883 that's about an odyssey from Texas to Montana. Mm -hmm. And so th I, this will be it. But you know, I was as I was driving across West Texas the day before yesterday, the sun was going down, and it was this wonderful, brilliant sunset. And I just thought how lucky I am. I can't imagine that I've gotten to, you know, help create this mythology of the West and mythology of Texas. You know, it's just, it's amazing to get to do this. And I'm, I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> well, so did you look at, um, did you like along the lines of the costumes literally break each of these scenes down with with Bill too or with Bill and Simon and oh. and literally recreate those places out because you were out in the middle of nowhere on some of these places you know oh you know Bill was all over that from top to bottom mm -hmm. and you know I I spent oh several weeks um, in his office long before we had a green light to do it doing some drawings um, of what uh, the Hat Creek outfit would look like and what uh, Lonesome Dove would look like and so and you know I was I was telling Bill one time that you know for all the research these little western towns had very little kind of flair ornamentation they were just pretty simple uh, functional places and he said well Let's give, let's give one of them a little bit of, of uh, flair, you know. And I said, well, but maybe we'll put this kind of uh, rounded cornice on top of Pumphrey's store. <laughs> and then I thought about what, what we could, you know, you got this perfect little frame, uh, it, and it called for something to be in there. And I thought, well, dummy, lonesome dove. Let's put a lonesome dove in there. That's a good idea. Let's let's do that. So that's 
that's that was the logo of the show. Uh -huh. you know? It was great. Oh, cool. Well, well, you brought up that store, and and Steve Harrigan in that same article was actually talking about um, the walking in there and seeing all the props uh, and and just you know trying to envision all of this, and then seeing up against the wall this um, I think he described it as a human form wrapped in burlap and lashed to a board with only one leg, and he said that. And this is again before the film is out about how poignant it was to see that prop because it meant so much in the book, right? It was such a, an emotional moment in the book. And so, you know, can you, this was like a, you know, talk to us about your job as the prop master and keeping all of those things accurate and, and emotional. Well, I, I, I started, I'm, I started out on this, I'm going to say this, I started out, this was only my second film, mm -hmm. and it was my second Western, and Carrie and I had done um, Red-Headed Stranger uh -huh. before that, so we sort of already knew Bill, and uh, we knew him well, and uh, so we went down that road with Bill, and Bill, Bill, you know, he did the same for me, I mean, we would talk about, we would go and take pictures of vans, I, I, and you've seen them here, um, I think the photographs, uh, the early photographs of costumes that are in black and white, they're in that room, and we would try you know, different props on the actors and, you know, but it also comes down to sometimes what that actor says I'd like to have, but we tried to stick with the book and tried to stick with what was called for. And one of those was, you know, the horse pistol, the, the dragoon, that was part of mm -hmm. Gus. It had to be, and even though Bob Duvall was kind of re reluctant about carrying that thing because it was so big, but I mean, he did. and and. You know, that, that was all, um, um, it was just a, a, I mean, it was a process every day where we, tr where for me, it was just dealing with that moment that day. And, and I tried to be in advance of it, but that was really, I found that to be difficult for a while because there was only two of us in the department for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then there became five or six after, after Bill and I had a conversation and we, we got more help, but including Reed <laughs> Whitliff came in on this, um, who decided he wanted to go to law school after that. <laughs> he did not want to be in the film industry after this. But, uh, you know, um, it was, uh, it was a, it was hard work. But but to your question also about you know do, you know do you know that you're making something? You know we, I think we all had a feeling that something special was happening, and not that many westerns had had come along at this point. Mm -hmm. Now we see a lot of westerns, and a lot were made after this. Um, but there was this feeling that something special is happening here because if you if you stand next to the camera long enough on set, you you were seeing it every day and I was next to the camera every single day but you would see that there was real you know gold happening mm -hmm. here and, and you know and also you could tell by the look on Bill's face a lot of the time you look at Bill and he'd just be smiling after every day you know? <laughs> so it was a good it was uh, but keeping up with the the props that was there were 13 there were 13 cowboys and 13 horses and our job was to prop all 13 cowboys and 13 horses not just the the guys but the tack on the horses uh -huh. and you know bill and carrie and all of us always talked about you know we're not going to be making another gun smoke here <laughs> and yeah. and you know five years after i did that i, I did a gun smoke <laughs> <laughs> with jim arness so it's it's like oh and, and they had to have it just a certain way you know it had to look like gun smoke you know it's like okay yeah so it's all kind of relative but yeah. but it was a good a good experience i still get people saying uh you know the the sets the costumes and the props and the saddles were so authentic i have people talk to me about that all the time well, Barry, so you, you know, embodying this character from a book, I mean, just somebody who's going to be beloved to the audience that's going to be watching it. And then also being, you know, up on, on the set with heavyweights that you were in. Like, how was that experience for you? Nick, how did you prepare? Um, I went to Mexico. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know, the first day, I mean, Robert Duvall, I saw him at the catering truck. And he walked up and said, we're making the godfather of Westerns. <laughs> And so, you know, I was 25 years old, and I was like, well, hell, he would know, you know? So, 
and then, you know, you sit around on the set and you see, you know, Danny Glover here and Tommy Lee Jones here. I mean, we kind of knew, you know, that we had something. We, we had to capture it in a bottle. But uh, I had all kinds of Bill Whitliff stories because he was, he had to walk by him to get to the set. And if you tried to pull anything, he would stop you and, and make sure your pants were tucked in or your spurs were right or something. <laughs> And I have a little story that I'll tell real quick because I came from a rodeo background. I'm from Snyder, Texas, and came up in a rodeo family. And I, and I kept trying to sneak my rope in to do some rope tricks. And I went to Bill and said, hey, Bill, can I do like a little you know, hula hand right there or something? And he goes, Barry, you get the script and the book. If you can find somewhere that Jasper does a rope trick, you can do it. So I went back to my room, and I'm looking through the book and this, you know, the, all that. Anyway, along the way, I'd made a little laddie go rope that I had. You, you, you rope, I roped my feet with it. And one day, Bill's not on the set, and I'm over there roping my foot, just like you do behind the shoots at a rodeo, and I'm roping my foot, and Simon Windsor, the director, saw me and says, come here. And he put me in front of the camera, and so there's one shot of us around the campfire, and the first shot is that rope going around my boot. <laughs> and, Bill, and Bill saw the dailies the next day, and he came to me and said, you little son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm like, hey, you know, it may not have been in the script, but it is now. <laughs> so no, we you know we we knew and it, you know it was one of those experiences growing up. I was regaled. My grandfather, we drove our cattle from Snyder to Fort Worth, and I heard stories. So, and I'd made it through Hollywood till I was 25. Nobody knowing I was a cowboy. So for me to be able to get that part, I was you know it's never been it's never been that good since. Don't think it has. <laughs> So one of the other things I thought was interesting, just looking into the, you know, all of y'all's backgrounds, is that you know everybody's from Texas. You you have this book that's an instant classic, um, but you now are about to be part of the team that's making this movie, and and you um, like Kara, I think you you've done some stuff for Taylor Sheridan, right, for Yellowstone, and and. Uh, he, this book has so is so in the psyche of anybody in the Western world that even his dogs are named Gus and Call, right? And and so so we you know like and I know plenty of people with dogs named Gus and Call and horses named Gus and Call, and and so so how was that pressure for you guys? I mean, was it something you were very aware of when you were working on it, like in the day to day, or were you just so in the action of getting this huge? project done, you know, like, that was that a pressure on you to be making something that everybody was going to have a huge expectation about? I mean, you mentioned The Godfather. That was the same with that book, right? You know, different crowd, but... Yeah. Well, the reason Taylor hired me is because I did Lonesome Dove. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's... I was just as green as Eric was um, when we did this show. Mm -hmm. I, there was no way I should have gotten that gig. But Bill, Bill wanted us, and so the studio hired us, and we we just worked all the time and didn't think about it. You just 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 uh, just worked nonstop mm -hmm. to try to get it done. No, you weren't. Nobody was worried about that. Too busy to think sure about. It was the too fear. Busy. Yeah. Uh, at least for me, I had this fear of getting through the day, uh -huh. and, and and it did it every day. But there was one day. <laughs> Where we, I don't think, I thought, this is it. This is going to, this is the day I go home. And, and it was the day that we shot the rattlesnakes. The rattlesnakes, oh yeah. And we, we had tried and tried and tried to find rattlesnakes. I didn't know enough uh, to know any better than to try to find, you know, to, then to plan ahead and, and have something ready to go, which we actually did. We had some old snakes frozen, but our freezer <laughs> broken down in, in our trailer, and so we didn't have those anymore. And... All night long, people have been looking for rattlesnakes and couldn't find any. And uh, but lo and behold, I had the word out to people, and here comes Jeff Schwan running to me at the last second. But right as I'm standing there, Simon is like, "Okay, it's, we're ready to roll. Put the snakes in." And I'm and I'm about to say, "You know what? I don't have any snakes today." And just as I'm about to say that, I go, "And here they are." <laughs> and they came running in, and we hung those snakes up, and there they were. And it was just like a miracle. And the same thing happened, I think, and, and all of us remember this, uh, when it was time to make snow in Angel Fire. Oh, God. The day that it was going, <laughs> that we were supposed to have snow, we had on the call sheet, make snow, special effects make snow, and it snowed on With us. the plate? And it snowed. No, this was the day it actually, we were, the, the Cowboys were in the blizzard, 
and that was real snow. And, and I still have that call sheet that says make snow. <laughs> and it was just a miracle. I remember, I remember Bill looking at me. People were in shorts that day. I mean, my assistant was wearing shorts, and her feet were getting cold. And she came and said, can I go get I said, you need to go. Wasn't it in May or June? It was in May. It was, in <laughs> June. It was in early a, June. In Angel Fire. Yeah. In yeah. Angel Fire, New Mexico. Yeah. And it snowed. And hard, not just a little bit, but a lot. <laughs> Someone from your department van said, we can't work in this. I said, are you crazy? We're going to shoot the hell out of this. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> we did. But that was, a, that was a hard day. But it was that was a day that I remember we were pretty well becoming veterans at that point. You know? oh, so yeah. we recognized this This was a miracle. You know? <laughs> and, and we weren't going to, by God, we were going to shoot that day. Shoot everything oh, we man. could. You bet. Well, so how much did serendipity end up in, in the film? Like, how much did that, Oddly, you know? I, more than I've ever seen on any other, and I've done a lot of films since then. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I've done 13 Westerns since then. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and that's just Westerns. I've done a lot of other films. But I, I've never seen that kind of serendipity. It's just, it's, we, we used to all sit around and not say anything, just look at each other and go, how did that happen? Well, do you all have some other moments like that that are that were just kind of out of the blue that shocked you that you ended up, you know, surely things happened with costume and with. Um, well, the worst was when they left. The, they, you know, we had two wardrobe trailers, and one was had all the men, and the other one had all the women. And the, well, we actually had three, and one had just undergarments for women. And they left us out. Do you remember that? That was right after the snow thing, and the Teamsters went off. We were wrapping all the trailers, oh, yeah. and they went off and left us in the middle of nowhere, and it started hailing. Yep. And I walked in, and all these people are, have run into the trailer, and they're all, all, all these people are there sobbing, and I'm thinking, what are we going to do with these people? You know, it's like, <laughs> and that was probably the worst evening we've ever had, because uh -huh. you couldn't get away from the hail. Wow. Was just, there was no place to go. Barbara, and they were all costumed up, you know what I mean? Like all the... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go right ahead. No, from, an, from the actor's standpoint, the first day that we actually rode horses, we had was the scene we rode naked. <laughs> so the first day, you found out pretty quick who could ride and who couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that was kind of a litmus test for who the cowboys were. And, and uh, that was one of many, you know. But, uh, I was on the Moody Ranch. Yeah, um, and, and my, personally, my first scene, first day of my shooting was with Robert Duvall on the porch of the, of the dry bean, and I never met him before until we walk up to shoot the scene. And I'm like, you talk about baptism by fire, I mean, hell, my first day, my first scene with Duvall, I mean, give me at least a couple days to kind of ease into this, you know. So, but every, you know, driving the cattle, all the things, if you got bucked off and you're a cowboy, you had to buy everybody a case of beer. So that happened a lot. <laughs> and anybody that didn't get bucked off is lying. <laughs> so. And, and Bobby got bucked off. Bobby got bucked off. Bobby hit the yeah, ground. On camera. Yeah. That scene where he gets bucked off the horse, that's actually him hitting the, hitting the yeah. ground and, and getting up. And, you know, it's, it's a bunch of guys, and we're all having, you know, luckily we had Mexico to go to every night. That was kind of the... <laughs> That, when we were in Del Rio, at least. Yeah. We, had, we, had a, we had a saying that if one of us wanted to go, all of us had to go. So that was... Well, so you, I mean, how, how much, too, like, that's 16 weeks was, of shooting mm -hmm. was an insane amount of shooting, and you guys were doing it continuously, right? I mean, there wasn't really a break, or was there? I think we did six-day weeks, didn't we? Or yeah. Did, yeah, we did six-day weeks. Oh, it weeks. gets worse, six-day weeks. Six, I, <laughs> thinking back on that, I think how hard that was. Uh, so, so, I mean, getting through to the end of that, like, four was, months of shooting. It was very difficult, because I had never done television before, mm -hmm. and I'd only done feature films that were like... like you know, like, not Westerns, that was my first Western, but I'd done, like, films for Horton Foot and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. They're very slow moving, and you shoot, like, three pages of dialogue a day, <laughs> and this was, like, five a day, which I was twice as fast, and it was just, I thought, is all television this hard? <laughs> you know, that's all I could think about, and I thought, this is unbelievable, yeah. unbelievably hard. And the, we never had a day off. We never had any time off because they worked them 12 hours a day, sometimes 13. They would get an extension, 14. And then we would have to go back and get the next day ready uh -huh. and finish up what they were working on for the, for the following week. And so it was like, it was exhausting. But it taught me that 
you can do anything yeah. under those circumstances. You can get through almost any any project. Yeah, and with storms and stampedes and but rattlesnakes. But I still go back to the one thing. Yeah. It, the one thing that Lonesome Dove taught me mm -hmm. in my career, and I think which helped me be successful, was the example that Bill said. Because if you're the first one in your department there, and you're the last one to leave. You can't ask people to stay and then you leave mm -hmm. and they keep working. You have to be there in order to get the, the most that, out of these people that you can. And that was a, that was a very good lesson. Yeah. And early, but so early in your career, that's a good <clears throat> segue. And like, this was very early for all of you. Like what did, now that you've had time to reflect and you've all gone on to a career in, um, in film and, and what did that experience being on that movie <laughs> To re, you know, teach each of you. I mean, plus Ed minus, I'm sure. But you know, what what was the experience like for your, you know, future way of looking at the business and your and your own craft? For me, I, I did Top Gun and then I did Lonesome Dove and that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was kind of like, hey, I, how am I going to beat that? So I moved to France. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie? Well, shows like that don't come along every day. I've yeah. been doing it for a long time. And, you know, just if you get one show like that, you are very lucky. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so, like, like I was saying, it's, my motto has always been it's better to be lucky than smart. So, uh, <laughs> Eric? Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I've, uh, I've actually gotten to produce some films now, and it, it gave me a lot of insight. It, it, you know, now I know how hard that other department's working. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it, it's not just a cliche. I just know when they come and say, we're going to need more time. I go, I know. <laughs> you know I know. You've got, you've got to have more time in that, and you're going to go into overtime. And, you know, so you plan it. You plan ahead for that. So. That's what it taught me. And also just to, you know, I learned just to be a little more calm about it, mm -hmm. a little bit as I go forward. Not that we were not calm, we were just, uh, again, living on that edge and knowing that we're making something wonderful, but at least I thought so, but, but still afraid you're gonna screw that whole wonderful up. So you're just trying your best yeah. to make it right. Van, you were going to say something? I think it teaches you to appreciate your crew and yeah. how hard they work mm -hmm. and that you never, never take anyone, you know, take advantage of anyone and their work. You learn how to see how people work and what they can do and mm -hmm. what they do best, and then you adjust it to that. But yeah. Boy, you can't do these things without a really good crew, and, and I had a great one. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like half of the magic ended up being who all worked together on it and that you were such a team and, and that Bill was a great leader. So, so with that, you know, that's, that's not, not always the case in a lot of film and television work. You, you know? never see anybody. Yeah, yeah. I think it made a lot of people fall back in love with Texas. Uh -huh. And uh, at least from, my, you know, from, from where I was from. But I think a lot of people didn't know about Texas until then. And so they, to be able to see it as authentic as it was and have such a great story. I mean, you know, it goes to McMurtry's book. Mm -hmm. If it's not on the page, it's not going to be on the stage. So it started with the book. And then the, just the whatever, Suzanne DePass at Canyon Ranch mm -hmm. in Arizona, and McMurtry had a manuscript of it and let her read the manuscript of it. And that's where it all began, because it was on the page. And then Bill put it on the page of the screenplay. And, you know, as I was saying, the fact that it won the Pulitzer Prize was a clue that it mm -hmm. was, we were working on something yeah. a little special. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it was, but you know, even when, well, I remember when Suzanne was telling that story about, about it winning the Pulitzer, that she, she worked for a year trying to get anybody oh, yeah. right. to yeah. do that film sure. and nobody would do anything. Nobody and, would. and then, boom, Pulitzer, then you guys are off and running, right? Um, so, you know, a little endorsement. But the, the fact was that, you know, just, like Barry said, it was on the page. You know, it was already beloved. It was a beloved piece of work, and um, and that 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 space of being able to do it over so many hours gave the opportunity to capture all of that, right? Like, could it, you know, could it have been done if it had been a two-hour movie the same way? 
you know? Hell no. No. I mean, we're in Whitliff's collection, but Bill Whitliff had an unbelievable amount to do with this being what it was. Yeah. He was the gatekeeper of Lonesome Dove. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know if the audience knows this, but the last scene in the movie was not in the book. Mm. That was created by Bill with the reporter in flashback to what had happened to all of these people. Hell of a vision. You know, was, that was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. When I was describing driving across West Texas in the sunset, I forgot to mention I was listening to McMurtry's Lonesome Dove audiobook. Uh -huh. So it, and it's so interesting to do that, to compare that book and know the film so well, because you can just see what Bill was doing it was so clever in how he did it. It was, it was he did such a w wonderful job of translating that book. Yeah, and I felt like it was just the right length, you know? Right. I mean, it was just the right length for right. a movie. I mean, now when everything gets stretched to seven episodes on Netflix, you know, sometimes you wonder why, you know? Like, mm -hmm. that could have been a movie. <laughs> I would have been happy with yeah. two hours and be yeah. out. But with this movie, like, you, it, like, felt, you know, I felt like at the end it, it left me wanting more, but at the same time I got the book, you know? I, I, I feel like that's also what, you know, I, I think it was that case of so many people watching the movie who had never read the book too, you know, and had an opportunity to go back and discover um, that book as well. Um, so, so any sort of, I know we're probably in a time zone issue here, but um, have anything you wanted to like add about, about that, that storytelling? I mean, the, the way that you're, you're part about it or even more about, you know, how you came into the project and feel like, you know, I can tell a real quick story. Um, a rodeo buddy of mine, Roy Cooper, had read the book and gave it to me and said, this will be the best Western ever made. I didn't read it. I gave it to my dad. He read it in three days. My girlfriend had left me. I'd entered a bull riding in Santa Maria, California, the day of the audition on a Saturday. I go in, and they keep me waiting for about an hour, and they have me in, and they say, Bill said, you read the book? And I said, no. He said, you read the script? And I said, no. I said, I just think we'd get on this if you don't mind. I gotta get on a bull in about three hours. And they picked up the script and started reading with me. And I left. And then my Monday morning, my agent called and said, What did you do? And I said, I know, I'm I'm sorry. I was just really a jerk. I'm sorry. They said, No, yeah, they offered you the part. <laughs> so little did I know that was the part. <laughs> so it was a happy accident for me. Well, so that see just just the outdoorsness of shooting this, and you know, you do obviously carry a lot of westerns, and that it's you know it must must be a difficult part of it because you're dependent on so many things. And you guys brought up Angel Fire before, but like that that all those scenes outside, like that, especially the ones that had to do with crossing the river, and you know, how difficult was that for everybody on the crew to really be part of the process to make those scenes look so great? I mean, were you all so actively involved in what was occurring because unpredictability of that is tough, yes? That uh, <laughs> cabin that they were, they built there mm -hmm. was made in uh, Bastrop, Texas <laughs> and moved over to Angel Fire. That was Angel Fire. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, that was Angel uh -huh. Fire for sure. Um, but, um, and we had had all that rain and we were in the this middle of this pasture um, there was so much mud on the truck I was driving that when I would drive through Angel Fire, people would come out of the out of the buildings to just to see this vehicle because they'd never seen a vehicle that covered in mud. <laughs> it was it was rough going out there. Yeah, I mean it must have been very difficult for you, especially with um, the what must have beat up those costumes and having it beat to beat up the costumes and you. We had to clean everyone's boots every night and dry them out, and so that. Oh my God! So we were up till, you know, one or two in the morning cleaning boots and drying them mm -hmm. so that they could put them on again the next day. And it was like, it, I've never experienced anything like this. In my <laughs> and I don't, you know, we got through it, and I and I thought, whoa, mm -hmm. but I've never had anything like this since. Yeah. It wasn't as cold as it looks in that shot. Yeah. It was, it was, because uh, I believe it was around May or June yeah. when yeah. we were there. But, uh, but it was real wet, and we had a lot of rain, and it was super muddy, and just you know, we were just bogging in. And it was hard. You had to drive a certain path to get to the set, 
every day. So you know. yeah, and it wasn't even cold when it snowed. It just snowed that no, once, it and then it was gone, <laughs> and that, that was it. Yeah. We need to mention the van got an Emmy. Oh yeah, right. 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 So he complains a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I mean, you know, but the, you both have been nominated for Emmys and won Emmys and for your work, yes. So I've been nominated three times. I've never won one. <laughs> oh, you never won one? Yeah. Well, we're giving you one now. Paul, I was just, um, so, so that, um, like, and we've got to wrap it up here. But the the question is like about the world that you enveloped us in, you know, I feel like that's what made it a classic because we all really felt we were in Lonesome Dove and we were watching it and we felt Gus and Call came off the page and everybody else too. So, I mean, you, you know, any, any piece you all want to add to, you know, what you felt like a moment on that set that you felt like you knew we, you'd captured that part at very least, you know? Pretty much every day. Yeah. I mean, it was... You know, I've never had an experience like that since. And I, I don't mean to be a killjoy, but I don't, I don't think in this today's making movies they'll ever be able to do it again. Yeah. Uh, there's just so so many moving parts that it just happened. You know, it was kismet. I mean, it it really did happen, magic in a bottle. And there were things that could you could never get away with again. Yeah. It, I mean, I, think it, I think it turns up on like top ten westerns, sometimes top five mm -hmm. that I've seen, and and that's. Just hugely it makes you proud every time you see that. You know? And uh, but I but I want to go back to the, the, the fact that we're all here and we all met because of Bill mm -hmm. Whitliff. And and you know he was really that producer, that kind of producer in TV who's really strong. He he takes the takes charge. He's a creative producer. There's a director, but by God, there's going to be some things that are done a certain way mm -hmm. that make all come together to make yeah. this one thing. I don't think I ever had a conversation with the director on this yeah. whole thing, <laughs> only with Bill. Because mm -hmm. Simon was never around when we were working in there. And no. But Simon was really good at the things that he did on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, Bill was really the guy that pulled it all in. And right. it, it's, it's hard. I, I know Carrie's done a lot of television and television series, and it's hard to find that. Oh, you yeah. Know? It's really hard to find that guy that, that really has the energy to pull it in. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, he yeah. had he had a passion for it. He, yeah. mm -hmm. That was his deal. And but he also had the knowledge, which the knowledge. was very helpful. Yeah. It, it, he could save you days of doing research by <laughs> just telling you what it mm -hmm. was, and then yeah. So all that passion made the film, you know, go from the book to the film, and it was. You were making the Godfather. That's what you did. Yeah, and it right? made us want to, I certainly wanted to please. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you tried really hard to make, to please. Right. It's fun to have been on Westerns since then and kind of have a smirk, you know, when people start talking about their Westerns and you're sitting in the back of a van and you're like, I was in a Western once. <laughs> 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 what was that? Uh, Lonesome Dove, and everybody gets quiet. You, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's definitely the bar. It, it, it became the bar for all right. Westerns. Yeah. You know, Houston Chronicle called it the greatest Western ever made. So Well, you know, and, and there are, like, I was still up until two years ago getting calls from people in Montana, these real cowboys, that they're working cowboys, and they, one of them wanted to know where Gus's belt buckle came from. <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I think it came from props. <laughs> and, but they, these guys go home every night after working cattle, and they watch part of Lonesome Dove every night. Mm -hmm. And this has been for 30 years mm -hmm. they've been watching this. And I'm thinking, boy, I'm going to have to blow my brains out. <laughs> 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 On that note. Um, <laughs> well, y'all, thank you. Thank you for um, coming, all of you, and talking um, about the filmmaker's voice and reminiscing about Lonesome Dove. And thank you all for attending. So we're going to wrap it up.